Hello and welcome to the After Sermon Podcast, where we learn about a Bible topic, character, or concept. And today we're learning about humility and repentance as we study the sermon, Naked and Ashamed. Jesus goes through all of that pain, all of that suffering, and all of that shame of being naked, not just to those people there, but to the entire universe, all so that we can be clothed in his righteousness, so we don't have to be naked anymore. So on that day of judgment, when each of us has to give account, God can look at us and look at our account and say, Ah, you're clothed in the righteousness of my son, you don't have to be judged. Hi, my name is Christopher. Ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a treat. Uh, we've been on a, on a bit of a hiatus, and so bringing everything back, we decided we'd bring in one of our very esteemed guests, and not just a guest on the podcast. Uh, quite a prolific author on the <laughs> Mighty Warrior Ministries website, Miss Kira Lee Josie. Hey, everybody. Now, I'd just like to clarify for the audience back at home. Do you pronounce it Kira or Kyra? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Why do you hate me? <laughs> it's Kira. Kira. Kira, Kira, Kira Lee. Lee. Okay. And then the other thing I'd like to clarify, do you pronounce it Josie or... <laughs> Per se, because I hear that you have a little bit of Spanish background. Is this true? Can you confirm or deny? Um, yeah, it's a joke that's gone way too far. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know, 1,000 years ago or something, my family was Spanish. Mm. I mean, my last name would have been Jose. But then my family moved to England and changed it. So they changed it to Josie. So I don't know. I like getting back to my roots, though. Yeah. So. I mean, you yeah. know, give us, give us some Spanish. Oh, um, <laughs> hola. Oh, hey. Come, no, no, I, I can actually okay, speak okay. a little. Let's um, go. Como estas? Ah, muy bien. Okay. <laughs> Good stuff. I feel like I'm about as, uh, as Spanish as you are. Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm as Spanish as you said. <laughs> well, we are glad to have you, whether you are Spanish or not. You see, <laughs> that is the beauty. This is genuine. That is the beauty of the new covenant, right? Yeah. No okay. more Jew nor Gentile. Everyone from all around the world is able to come and talk about God. So, yeah, I, yeah. yeah, whether you are or are not Spanish, it's cool. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter where you're from. We get to talk about some very exciting things today. So, let's get into our recap of this sermon. But just before we do, if you have not watched the sermon, Naked and Ashamed, go to the link below, come back here later, because this podcast is full of spoilers. With that out of the way, let's go to our quick recap. The sermon begins by addressing the concept that no one likes to be naked or ashamed. We always feel our most vulnerable and exposed when not wearing any clothes. Not only that, but we find it offensive to see other people naked, and so not only has our modern society, but also the biblical society created laws around the ideas of nakedness or indecent exposure. We then go to a text in Exodus 20 and verse 26, in which God says not to build steps towards his altar so that people's nakedness could accidentally be uncovered. So, is this concern of God's about nakedness purely a physical reality, or is there a spiritual dimension to this concept? In order to discover the answer to this question, we go to Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3 in which we see that Adam and Eve are naked but feel no shame because they are without sin. However, when they sin, they both realize that they are naked and so try to cover themselves. It is here that we see the symbolism that nakedness represents sin and being clothed represents being sinless or righteous. We then see that God tries to institutionalize the idea of clothing people or covering people's nakedness through the sanctuary system, in which the death of a lamb would atone for the sins of an individual. However, there's a catch. You see, the gift of grace is free, but there is one small cost, and that is our pride. In order to receive mercy and the forgiveness and the clothing, the robes of righteousness that Jesus offers, it first demands that we admit that we are naked and ashamed. It requires that we swallow our pride and realize that we need to repent and ask for forgiveness. 
Unless we do that, we will still be stuck in our sin. But the good news is that if we come boldly before God's throne, He is more than willing to give us His robes of righteousness, so that He no longer sees our nakedness and sin, but instead sees the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. All right, well, Kira, let's get into our personal takeaways. What did you get out of this sermon? Um, so what I got out of this sermon is um, the big point when you said that grace is a free gift, but it comes at a cost. Mm -hmm. And when you said that, I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know, that, that's, not, that's not good. <laughs> um, because, you know, we're just taught, like, you don't have to do anything for grace. You just get it. Mm -hmm. But what you were saying was so true, though, because it does require you to come before God and to be, you know, just fully, fully vulnerable. And when you said that, like, to make the sacrifice at the sanctuary, mm. the person would have to walk through the entire city. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> the whole city with, like, the lamb. I was like, oh, imagine how, like, shameful that would be. Mm. Like, he said, like, they're walking naked, um, basically, through the city. That's what it would have been like. Yeah. Um, and everybody's just looking at them like, yeah, what did they do? Yeah. Like, <laughs> again? Like, this is the second time yeah. of the week. Like, <laughs> True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you'd be keeping tabs. Yeah, like, yeah. Who comes like, past you're your watching your neighbors and you're like, oh, again? Yeah. So, I was thinking, thinking about that and, like, how it does require, um, getting grace requires us to get out of our comfort zone, really, and... But it's so easy just to stay there. Mm. So. And it's interesting how we often justify staying there as well. We mm. like tend to think that we're okay and we don't really need to admit that we're wrong. Or we think like, well, if I know that it's wrong, I mean, like that makes it better, right? Yeah. But it's like, okay, like that's a good start. But the, the next step of acknowledging that you're wrong is then going and saying, oh, I'm sorry for doing the wrong thing, not just... Yeah, being like, oh, I'm wrong. Like, I'll, I'll do that all the time. I'll be like, yeah. oh, yeah, that wasn't right. And then I'll just be like, well, guess who's not getting an apology? Anyway, <laughs> like, this is not good. Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty intense how we do that. Um, yeah, I think uh, for me, what was fascinating, uh, without going into details, the day that I preached this sermon, um... I basically got to see a demonstration of this concept happen. Um, I was watching uh, some people having a disagreement, and towards the end, one of them just said, you know what, I apologize, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, I did the wrong thing. And in my head, I was just like, what? That's exactly what I preached about. And I was just, it was really cool to be able to see that in action, where one of the parties just came to the other person and said, you know, uh, I, I'm sorry, um, yeah, I, I did something, I did something wrong by you. Um, and so I think that's a really powerful thing to be able to watch because no one really likes to do that because it takes so much, you know, to do that. Uh, it, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like, you know, the concept of being the bigger man. But we always say, you know, oh, be, be the bigger man and say sorry, yeah. but no one wants to be no, the bigger no man. No, <laughs> you don't feel like the bigger one. No, no one wants, yeah, and that's the other thing, you don't feel like it, hey. Yeah. And no one wants to do it because then you don't get to, like, wallow in your own, like, um, I'm right little bubble. Because everyone likes to be there, right? As you said, that's mm. the comfort zone. You just get to stay here and be like, I'm right. Everyone's wrong. Come at me, you know. It's my favorite place. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. <laughs> yeah, so interesting stuff. Well, let's get to the main meat of our podcast, The Cutting Room Floor. Kira, what is The Cutting Room Floor? The Cutting Room Floor is the segment where we discuss the parts of the sermon that didn't make it into the final product and break them down. Beautiful. All right. So, let's get uh, into some interesting stuff. Uh, let's turn to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 5. We're going to go on a bit of a journey here. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 5. And this is describing the call of Moses uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the story, at this point in time, Israel is in Egypt. They are enslaved by the Egyptians. And this character Moses, who has run away from Egypt, is now being called by God to set uh, the Israelites free from slavery. Uh, Kira, would you be able to read for us uh, chapter 3 and verse 3 and 4? So Moses thought... I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. 
When the Lord God saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. <laughs> All right, immediate thoughts. Why is Moses okay? <laughs> I've been reading a lot of the Old Testament lately and something will happen and everybody's just like, oh yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I don't understand. Um, I've been uh, reading up on this chapter for some research for a tour assessment, which uh Kira, you really should start. <laughs> Sorry, I'll edit that out. I didn't get started. I asked David about my question. <laughs> hey, nice. What number yeah. are you going to do? <laughs> Exodus 32. 32? What's 32? Gold cup. Oh, hey. Solid yeah. choice. All right. Where were we? Ah, uh, yes. Um, and a lot of the commentators, they're always saying, like, yeah, I don't know why Moses is so chill. Like, <laughs> yeah, like here I am. Here it's I am. Right. He, um... Yeah, it just says, like, he sees, like, this burning bush, and so his curiosity is piqued. Um, but why, yeah, what do you think, apart from Moses being really chill about mm. this bush being here, why do you think he responds with, here I am? Mm. I guess, what else can you respond with? I don't <laughs> yeah, know. True. Like... If you look at the pattern... There's a pattern in the Bible. And maybe I'll ask you that question again when we look at the pattern. Can you think of any other times where God has called someone and they've replied, Here I am. Uh, Samuel. Samuel. All right. Describe to us Samuel. Um, so he's hearing God call out in the night. And like, what, what does what does God call out to him? Oh, is, is it just Samuel? Yeah, but it <laughs> says it twice. It's Samuel, yeah. Samuel. And here we have Moses, Moses. <laughs> True. Call twice. Yeah. Got him. Um... <laughs> Yes, yeah, so he calls Samuel, and Samuel doesn't think it's God, but then eventually he figures yeah, it out. Yeah, he figures it out, yeah. And then he says, yeah, here I am. Yeah. Um, but there are also two other uh, times that this happens. One is in Genesis 22. Oh, actually, three times. Look at that. Uh, Genesis 22, and I'll look up Genesis 31. Um, in Genesis 31, verse 11, God calls out to Jacob, and Jacob says, here I am. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in Genesis 22, it should be in the first few verses. Yeah. Um, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. He mm. replied. Yep. Here I am. And then our last one is in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. And that passage says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Oh, okay. So... Reading all of those texts, what do you think the idea of replying with here I am indicates? It's like sort of saying I'm here, talk to me, like mm. I, I'm willing, I'm willing to hear what you have to say, mm. I think. I like that idea of a willingness. I think it's not only a willingness to hear, but a willingness to, to do. It's just yeah. like... Because uh, think about the the Hebrew word for shema, uh, it's the the it means both hear and obey. The idea for, for the Israelites was hearing hearing something and obedience were synonymous. So when you say yeah I'm listening or I'm hearing, mm -hmm. you're at the exact same time saying I'm also going to obey. So it indicates this idea of willingness. So each time God calls these people, he's just like hey psst, bud. And they go, yeah, what do you want me to do? <laughs> so they both say at the same time, I'm listening, but also, yeah, what do you want me to do? Mm. And so here we see Moses. Moses gets called from the bush and he says, yeah, all right, I'm here. What do you want me to do? So the idea, here I am. God calls out to you and you say, here I am. Can you think of a time in the Bible where it would have been perfect for someone to answer with that, but they didn't? Jonah. That's what I thought. Oh, like, nice, nice. Yeah, follow know. that thought. Follow that thought. It wasn't where I was thinking. But <laughs> like, it, it works. It all well, like Jonah, God was calling Jonah to go and um, preach in this um, other city called Nineveh. Mm. And Jonah just was not excited about it. Yes. And so to the point where he um, went on a ship in the opposite direction, mm -hmm. got swallowed by a big fish. Like, it, it was Good very stuff. not keen. <laughs> <laughs> like, if he just said, here I am, he wouldn't, wouldn't have got... Mm. Well, that wouldn't have happened. Like, he got to the place in the end. Yes. That's the thing. Like, God God knows where he wants you. Mm. But. So with Jonah, that indicated a... The absence of here I am indicated uh, no desire of willingness to do yeah, what God said. Like, no. I'm out of here. The, the one I think of, 
uh, when I hear the here, here I am is Adam and Eve. Oh, yeah, yeah, in the garden. In the garden. Yeah. Cause, so they've just sinned and they're all hiding because they're all like afraid and stuff because sin and nakedness, right? And then um, I'll just read it out for you in Genesis 3, verse 9. God called out to Adam and said to him, where are you? And it wouldn't it be perfect for Adam to say, here I am. <laughs> you know, that would be perfect. Yeah. But instead he just goes... Adam like pops out and he's like, uh, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid. I was naked. So I hid myself. It's just like, wow. Like, uh, what, oh, what, a what a defense. What a defense. He doesn't even like try to lie. Um, yeah. Well, he doesn't really know how to lie, does he? Not yet. Like, he's uh, all figuring out this whole sin <laughs> thing, you know. Yeah. Poor guy. Um, but yeah, he, he's just like, oh, I was afraid. I was naked, you know. Um, so... What then I think that leads us to, which we didn't get to quite address in the sermon. Uh, okay, so we're already in sin, and we have the opportunity to repent. Now, if we do not repent, if we do not repent, we cannot say, here I am. Uh, because look at this, the, the people who are in sin are afraid of God. They don't want to have anything to do with God, so they hide from it. They're never going to reply to God, yeah, here I am. Instead, only those who... Uh, have a re right relationship with God, mm -hmm. who are clothed in God's uh, in the righteousness of Christ, are able to hear God's voice and say, "Yep, yeah, what do you want me to do?" So not only does the unwillingness to repent affect your spirituality, but it also affects God's mission and God's ability to work through you, uh, which is pretty crazy if you mm -hmm. think about it. God wants to work through His people, but if they're unwilling to come and repent to Him first, He's like can't really use you because you're not going to want to do anything with me. Mm -hmm. um, and we're very assured that God wants to work with his people. <laughs> In Isaiah 65 and verse 1, uh, this is what God says to his people. I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. Isn't that interesting? That here God says to his people, when other people call out to God, God says, oh, here I am. But he says it twice, similar to Moses, Moses, or Samuel, Samuel. He's like, here I am, here I am. So, I don't know, cool parallel. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, if we go back to Exodus, sorry, we're, we're all over the place this morning. It's a journey. <laughs> it's a journey. We're going through the wilderness. <laughs> through the wilderness, 40 years. 40 years, 40 minutes. <laughs> Read about uh, Exodus chapter three uh, and verse eleven. Uh, can you read that out for us, Kira? But Moses said to God, "Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt?" Mm -hmm. So Moses is having some doubts. He's like, uh, "I don't know if I'm the right guy for the job." Like, mm -hmm. here I am, but ah, uh, now that I actually know what you yeah, want, no thanks. No th <laughs> Cool idea. Um, <laughs> Someone else, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love how, actually, I love how Joan was just like, no, nah, not even a good idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just like, don't send anyone. Do, like, send me, but I'll go that way. Yeah, I'll go <laughs> that way. <laughs> um, and so, ha so, okay, uh, pay close attention to this, who am I? Um, the who am I, uh, it, it, it is... It will come into handy later. So, in verse 3, when Moses says, here I am, it's based on the word, uh, the Hebrew word, hine. And then, uh, we have something interesting. In 3.14, so Moses asked, what's your name, God? And God said to Moses in verse 14, I am who I am. And you're just like, oh, what? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's interesting. Verse 11 who am I, Moses says. And then verse 14, God says, I am who I am. <laughs> so the response to Moses' question of, uh, I'm not the right guy for the job, God says, like, Moses, it doesn't matter about you. It's me. It's me. Yeah. Um, and the Hebrew uh, used uh, in God's name is ehie, uh, deriving from the same verbal root as hine, ehie. Uh, and similar, a similar word is used in 
verse 4 with the here I am, because you have the I am words again. So it's, the, the, the whole chapter is written very intentionally mm -hmm. uh, with this repetition of this same word being used in slightly different ways. Um, and what's interesting is, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm probably going to stuff this up, uh, but I'm pretty sure that the I am who I am is written in the first person singular Carl, Perf Carl Imperfect future tense. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the non-Hebrew people out there, uh, that just means, let's just say, the imperfect tense means is continuous, has not been completed, first person is obvious, and future tense is the future. So it's like, I'm always in the future continually being me. Um, uh, some people describe it as God basically says, I am ising. <laughs> I'm is. Yeah. So he's like, I, you know, like, I is, or I am. <laughs> I is who I is. I, <laughs> <laughs> I is who I is. <laughs> what of it? You know? <laughs> so yeah, he says, I is, he basically does. He says, I is who I is. And not only that, I am the one who is constantly ising. I am the one who always is being. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> listeners at home, listen to uh, Kira slowly lose her sanity <laughs> as she slowly spirals, spirals, contemplating the the phrase I use. Right? <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> Anytime I hear it from now, it's gonna get. <laughs> but that's essentially what it means. And so, what God is guaranteeing to Moses is. Um, you don't have to worry about things because I'm always going to be with you. I'm like the constant here. Um, and then, so he appeals to the future, but then he also says a few times during the chapter, I am the one, I'm the, the, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he says, I've also been with you in the past. Um, so you really don't have to worry about it, Moses. Like, if I've been here in the past, if I've been there in the future, and I is now, <laughs> then... You don't have anything to worry about. Sorry, I shouldn't have said is again. <laughs> <laughs> you were doing so well, and then I, I ruined it for you. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and we can have that same assurance, right? Mm -hmm. um, that God's going to be there in the future, in the past, and here for us now. Um, and so he wants to work with us where we're at. But even then, I think that we still struggle to believe it. Mm. Like, God's like... To, to Moses, like, I looked after all these people, and to Moses, he would have been like, yeah, I guess, but like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he probably would have been like, well, that was 400 years ago, so uh, what up that? Was that was so long ago. And yeah. Then, like, for us, we're told, like, look back at these stories. Look at how God looked after these people. And we're like, ah, that was like a literal um, 4,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how do we bridge that gap then, do you think? Hmm... I think just by realizing that God is always looking after his people and mm. like these stories were given to us for a reason. Mm. Um, the stories that we have about in the Bible were, um, were all um, put there all written down, I believe with, um, by God. Oh no, this is inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I believe that all the stories in the Bible um, have been intentionally given to us. Like God inspired the people to write them down. Um, and these are the stories that we need um, to see. So this is the way that we need to see God moving throughout people. So we can look at the stories in the Bible and then we can look at the stories that have happened like today. Like you still hear miraculous things. You know, mm. there was literally no explanation for that. Yeah. But, but God. So I think just by realizing that it's continuous, like God didn't suddenly just stop existing, I guess, at the end of the Bible. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> stop existing. Yeah, <laughs> the Bible. I'm out. Bye. I see it. He's like, uh, I, I was. I got, <laughs> I got published. I got, pu <laughs> I got published. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's made the big leagues now. He's like, all right, see you. He's like one of those authors where he releases like one book. And then you're like, oh, he's gone now. Sad. That's not it. That's not it. God, God does not release one book. Mm. Actually, he does. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> 
hey, but it's a bestseller. Oh my gosh, she literally did just write a bestseller. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, that's it. It is the bestseller. Like, All right, how about this though? Paul says in Second Corinthians chapter three. So Ch- certain. Have a check. Yeah. Um, he says, uh, our testimonies are, no, are not written on bits of paper or in stone, but are instead written upon your hearts. Mm. So, although we don't have, you know, God's revelation written down anymore in biblical, like, like we do with the Bible, um, we have the testimony of individual people over mm. time, and they're able to share their experiences. Yeah, um, in Hebrews... 12, I think. It's it's... 70. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I'm sad I'm also. <laughs> Hebrews 12. Um, I think verses 1 and 2. It says mm-hmm. that um, we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Mm-hmm. So, like, and those are the people who we're meant to look to as an example of faith. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so then I suppose that, again, so- helps us solve that problem of how do we bridge the gap? Mm. Um, if we, yeah, mm. appeal to those, those witnesses, we can say, like, okay, hey. What did God do for you? Or, ah, here's something I find interesting. I've always wanted to do a sermon on this. Maybe one day. Episode, like, 150. (laughs) Um, But the idea that whenever something significant happened for the Israelites, they always built, like, an altar. Um, Mm -hmm. Just a few examples. uh, Jacob has his vision at Bethel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's like, altar. altar. Um, Israelites cross the Jordan River. Joshua's like, build an altar. Um, They just build altars all the time. And then uh, most often they... Most of the time, they give the reasoning why, and they say it. They say, uh, "We built this altar so that when your children come and visit this place, and they say, hey, what up with the altar?' You can then tell them the story of what happened here.' Mm-hmm. Um, I really like that idea of there's like a physical reminder of the things which God did for you. Um, we don't really have so much things like that today, um, but if you want, you could like kind of defeats the purpose of skipping the physical reminder part, but you, you're still able to go and interact and ask people, hey, what did God do yeah. for you? You know, what has happened in your life? Um, or even think about Jesus, uh, when he heals the, the guy with the, who's crippled. He says, pick up your mat and walk. Now, that would have been the festiest mat ever. I mean, yeah. like, this guy's been crippled for years. Mm. I think probably hasn't been washed. It's been on the dirt for years. Like, mm. I, it's probably barely holding up together. If yeah. I were Jesus, I'd be like, you know, leave that mat. You, yeah, that, that, do, do not take that. Do not take that. Uh, that, your life, that part of your life is done away with, you know. You can walk now. Leave that behind, you know. Wouldn't that have been a, been a great symbol? Mm. But in taking the mat with him, that guy will forever have a physical reminder of, this is what my life used to be. Mm. And then, you know, people can ask, hey, what, what happened to you? And he's like, oh, well, this is what Jesus did for me in my life. Mm. Um, yeah. I think we can still have that, mm. like, like you were saying. Just not in the physical sense, but, like, um, you, you can be like, <laughs> peace. <laughs> no. um, basically, you can look at people. Um, often I'll find, and um, I'll know them, like, at one point, especially mm. with one, one girl I have this, like, I knew her when we were younger, and then I also know her now, and we had, like, this massive gap mm-hmm. in between, and when we were younger, it was a little bit interesting, like, we didn't super get along well, Sure. Um, now we're older, and so, like, hey, what happened, and well, you know, she's really encountered Jesus, and um, it's sort of like changed her. So you can sort of like, I think people can tell like when people, I don't mm. know, when, when you have that relationship with God, like you're going to change and maybe it, it's like you have a mat mm. a little bit, like, because people will know what you were like. People True. will know what was happening yeah. to you. Um, if they've known you in the past, they'll be able to see you now and be like, what? Like, mm. what changed about you? And so. That's interesting. Yeah. Just like your different character can be that mat. Yeah. Mm. That's really cool. Man, Oof, we're all over the place. How does this relate to repentance again? <laughs> I don't know. This is uh, welcome to the After Seven podcast, where uh, we go on a journey, we take a few detours, but we imbue you with some biblical knowledge. Oh, I love that word. Imbue. imbue. It's a good word. It's a good word. Well, uh, let's go to our last little part. We're going to look at the idea of humility versus pride. So, um. Hebrews 4.13. How about we read this fun verse that I'm sure everyone loves. Hebrews chapter 4, 
and verse 13. And it says, There is no creature hidden from his, that is God's sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him Ugh. to whom we must give account. Uh, ah. No, I like it. You can't at least wear clothes. Come on. No. Nah. See, uh, yeah, probably prob no one's favorite verse. Okay, so uh. what, let's break it down. So nothing's hidden from God's sight. So it's like, okay, already that sounds pretty scary. Yeah. But uh, also in his sight, everything is naked. And you're just like, oh. Oh, why? <laughs> Come on. And uh, in your nakedness, everyone must give account of what they've done. You're just like, oh, man. So do you like that little progression of like how? It just gets worse and worse. It just gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. How does that make you feel? Yeah, well, I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't know, just the thought of like, okay, give me, give me a count, like standing up and like mm. talking about what you've done. That's bad enough. Yeah, that's, that's pretty that's bad. That's pretty bad. Like, yeah. God, God knows everything that you've done. Even worse, you're doing it whilst naked. That is not my uh, <laughs> preferred method of talk, of like being when I'm talking. Um, ugh. Yeah, not good. Not good. Not good. Not like, good. <laughs> no matter how you look at it, like, it's nothing good. Okay, but all right. Now I'm thinking about this, right? So we're already naked, right? And we're going to have to give an account at some point. Yes. So it kind of becomes, would you rather do it on your terms? And I say your terms, but like, yeah. would you rather make the choice of going up to God and just admitting? So give your account and just like admitting, yeah, I did like all these bad things, right? And I'm asking for repentance. Or would you rather not do that and just play this waiting game and then wait for Day of Judgment to come where God has to say, Oi, <laughs> come here, buddy. <laughs> come here. And you walk up to him trying to hide your naked yeah. self and he's just like, all right, now I'm going to have to tell you. Now I'm going to give you an account of what you've done since you didn't come and tell me, you know? Um, geez, uh, the, uh, that's bordering on sounding a bit Catholic now, like, uh, forgive me, Father, I've sinned here, all the things that I've done wrong. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Obviously, go to God, do not go to a, a priest in a booth. But, like, the principle is the same, right? It's either you come to God, yeah. not the same, ah, words, the principle still holds, that, um, either you come to God of your own volition and your own will and say, God... I admit I've done all these things wrong and I ask for repentance, in which case you are clothed. Mm. Or you, again, you wait it out and then eventually God has to say one day to you, all right, come here, I need to tell you, because uh, you obviously didn't want to admit it. And like, it's, so, so uh, you're going to be naked and you're going to have to give an account at one point. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, which, which, which one do you want? Which one do you want? But it goes against like everything that's mm. in us, right? Like, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm so prideful. Like, I don't want, I drop things a lot. Like, <laughs> I, I like, I'll, I'll drop like my books, my keys, like daily, like multiple times. <laughs> and everybody just looks at me and they're like, oh, that's what Kira does. Yeah. Like, and I don't like doing that. Now, the thought of like coming before God, like, and saying like, this is what I've done wrong. Um, yeah, I suck. It does seem so much like more, mm. and it seems to have so much more volume to it. Yeah. Um, like people, I've, people have already seen me like drop things, be stupid. And then the thought of like, God also seeing that. You dropping things? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm just wondering why God made me so clumsy. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, it, it does go against everything that we have as humans. We just don't mm. like it. Like, again, think of Naaman. He's asked to do something really simple. And that's the other thing, right? Yeah. Repentance is very simple. It, it's not like a, like, it's hard for us to do, like, mentally. But, like, it, it doesn't require any physical exertion. Yeah. It doesn't require, you know, you go and do some huge feats. It's actually a very simple task. Um, it, it's very easy. God doesn't ask for much, um, yeah. but we just really don't like the idea of it. And so Naaman, you know, he's told, if you want to be healed from your leprosy, uh, you need to go and wash in the Jordan River. And he's like, I don't want to do that. It's gross. Yuck. And he didn't want to do it because of his pride. And, you know, uh, Elisha sends out his servant instead of coming out to himself. And Naaman gets annoyed. He's like, where's Elisha yeah. at? And he just goes, uh, he's in the house. He's like, 
well, why doesn't he come and talk to me? He's just like, just, just go wash. He's like, what? We, yeah, humans, we just get so yeah. proud and... But it's been on us from the very beginning. Like, yeah. with Adam and Eve, like... Yeah, true. Hmm. Humans. Well, think about even like the original sin, right? With Lucifer. He was pride. Yeah. It's like, I can be better than God. I could do, you know, a better job. Uh, why not me? And so, kicked out. Um... Are you ready for things to get even more intense? Mm. Yeah, you yes. are. Yes. Yeah, you are. All right, Luke 8, 17. You want to read this uh, yeah, harrowing sure. verse for us? It's harrowing. Okay, Luke 8, 17. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Ooh. Can't hide anything. <laughs> now, um, nothing is hidden, right? And then take into account as well that Paul says elsewhere in Second Corinthians again. Oh, look at Second Corinthians so coming up. Yeah. Um, that we are basically on display for the universe to watch. <laughs> 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 And you can't that, see me, but I'm like seeing back in my chair. And I'm like, oh no! Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, because the angels and mm. the other created beings of God yeah, are all are looking wanting, on. They're all looking on, wanting to see how this whole sin thing works out. Oh. Yeah, Kira is having a fall meltdown <laughs> as we speak. So the scope of it gets keeps just getting bigger and bigger, right? Because you're like, okay, well, obviously God sees everything. But yeah. Like, oh man, but like. So is like the whole universe. Like yeah, this. No. Also, uh, if you want to learn more about that Bible verse and more about oh, the concept yeah. of uh, being on display for the universe, go check out uh, Jesse Mark's sermon, Theater of the Universe, and make sure to check out the podcast of it as well. I think it's episode 11, Theater of the Universe. Go check it out. Mm. Good. Good stuff. Good stuff. I think, I think it was voted as fave... Oh, thumbnail. Thumbnail yeah. by a few people. No, it's funny you, how you and Jesse, right? Yeah. For like yeah. exactly the same reason. <laughs> yeah, there we go. It's a good thumbnail. Check it out. Um, yeah, so like we got all these people watching us. Uh, and so it can, like, depression get to you. Uh, uh, I won't go fully into it, but Jesse does talk about how we can avoid, like, getting this paranoia yeah. from doing it. Uh, but rest assured, it's not something that we should have every waking day, the waking moment of the day be like, oh, people are watching. They're watching me, they're people watching me, they're coming for me. <laughs> yeah. That would be incredibly unhealthy. Please do not. Don't do that. Please That's don't be news. terrified by that idea. Here's the good news. Here's what I've been building up to, and here's a little bit of an Easter tie-in, if you want. Um, yeah, this is as much of an Easter special as we're going to get this year. <laughs> um... Jesus, uh, when he was on the cross, they always crucified people naked. Hey, interesting, right? And think about this. Mm. In Earth's history, the most climactic thing that can happen, the one point where everyone is going to be looking, was Jesus on the cross. Because that was the point in which God demonstrated his love in the greatest way by offering up his own life in order to save sinners. So think about this, the entire world is watching Jesus, and all right, let's 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 begin with the premise that first of all, he is physically naked. Yeah. Then, let's, the meltdown begins no, to no, no, <laughs> And then we think about the fact that, of the spiritual nakedness, because, yeah. all right, so let, let's just say, like, you have your sin, I have my sin, right? Um, you have, like, you're naked, or I'm, I'm naked, yeah. spiritually, right? Yeah. Um, and people can see my sins. But here we have Jesus who literally is taking on the sins of every Everybody's single person. Sin. And so that is like some intense spiritual nakedness. Mm. Um, I, I, I like to use this illustration. Let's, let's imagine that one sin is the equivalent of one, a one kilo brick. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a lot of bricks. <laughs> that's a lot of bricks. So let's, let's just start off yeah. with, I'll start off with myself. Uh, let's say, how many lies have I told? I think I could probably, like, fill this room that we're in with bricks. Oh, uh, yeah. You, you listen to home, you can't see it, but I don't know. How, how big is this? Like, uh, four, like by, four by four, three by three? Yeah. Three by three. Okay, that. Yeah, probably like that. 
And if I'm being honest, it's probably a bit more than that. But let's just start yeah. with a three by three room of one kilo bricks. Could um, I carry that on my back? Not no. even close. Not, not even, even close. close. So that's just my lies. Yeah. <laughs> Think about every other sin I have. Uh, I'd say like I could probably fill. We're, we're in the library at the moment. Yeah. I'd say I could probably fill all the shelves in this library full of oh, bricks with my sins. Same. I feel like double. Double, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, right? And so if we think of it in a physical sense, we're just like, like heck, I could carry all those sins on my back. Okay, now let's see if we can combine both of ours. Now we have like, what, two or three libraries worth of one kilo yeah. bricks. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, let's think about the people in Australia. How many have we got? 23. 24, 24 million. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really feel like carrying all those sins. No, that's a lot of All right, let's think. World population, what, 7 billion? Yeah. Yeah, hard pass. All right, let's, <laughs> hard pass. <laughs> let's think about every single person who has lived in the past. So many. So many. So many people. Think about physically the how many kilos of bricks one person is now having to sustain. Oh, that's crazy. Stupid. Yeah. Uh, now, obviously, it, it doesn't quite perfectly translate into a spiritual sense, but I like to think that, you know, I, I think, like, you can feel, in a, a sense, like, you know, spiritually, you can feel, like, weighed down, something like that. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, so, to, to try and transfer that, then, I think it's easier for us to think in a physical sense and then take it to the spiritual. Mm -hmm. Imagine the weight on Jesus' shoulders that is happening spiritually as it's he insane. is. It's, it's insane. Mm. It's ridiculous. Um, and so Jesus goes through all of that pain, all of that suffering, and all of that shame of being naked, uh, not just to those people there, but to the entire universe, all so that we can be clothed in his righteousness, so we don't have to be naked anymore, mm -hmm. so that on that day of judgment when... Pardon me. So on that day of judgment, when each of us has to give account, God can look at us and look at our account and say, ah, you're clothed in the righteousness of my son. You don't have to be judged. You're fine. Like, that's crazy. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. um, there you go. There's your Easter tie-in. <laughs> and, yeah, I, I think that kind of basically sums up everything that we've been talking about. Um mm -hmm. And then, like, if you think about everything that Jesus went through for us, is it really such a big ask for God to say then to us, um, you know, if you have a problem with someone, go out and go and ask them for forgiveness? Because, mm -hmm. like, it's hard to do that. You know, I tell someone I did something wrong, I, I want your forgiveness. It's hard to do that. But, like, compared to what Jesus did for us, it's such a small ask. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like the least that we can do, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, oh, goodness me. Like, I'm just thinking, like, I know that when I do something, um, when I, when I sin, I'll feel, like, really, really weighed down, like you were saying, like, mm. like I'm carrying a few bricks. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you give it over to God. Mm. So, like, I'll do that through, like, praying and say, hey, God, like, I did this, like, you know, take take it from me, and mm. um, so God, and God then takes that like, He's just taking like all the burdens mm. like constantly, yeah, constantly. And okay, I, I I've only I've only just thought of this now. Mm -hmm. We always think right about the idea of, you know, God take my burdens, and then he's just like, oh. But I think often we think that those bricks just go like into a black hole somewhere. We yeah, never, like in oblivion. Yeah, we never think about where they go. It's like, oh God, take them. They're just like, oh wow, those bricks are gone. It's like, yeah, but you know where they went? They went back onto the cross. Yeah, that's back where into Jesus. That's where it all just keeps going back onto. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah there, are, there are like consequences uh, to, to what we do. But I suppose it all just comes back to this idea of, yeah, um, God loves us so much that he's willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes one of the things that can stop us as well, apart from our pride, is we can sometimes feel unworthy. Um, I talked a little bit about that in the last podcast, Fighting Face to Face. Mm -hmm. um, highly recommend looking at that. Sometimes our feeling of unworthiness can prevent us, because like, no, 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 like, it's fine. I did this because I love you. 
You don't have to like worry about it. You don't have to stress about it. You don't have to be good enough for it. You don't have to work for it. It's here. It's free for you. And I want you to have it. Mm, I, um, I went through that feeling a few weeks ago, actually. Like, Mm. um, I came back to college and I came off, I came off like a prac, um, do, I do teaching. So I came off a prac. I was really, really tired, but I was just thrown straight back into college life. Um, and that meant that I literally did not, um, well, I thought I didn't have a spare second and my devotional life just went like straight down. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, it was really bad. Like, um, I wasn't even doing anything. Like normally I'll listen to like a worship song or something. Nah, I wasn't even doing that. And like, it was so bad. So like for a week it went on like that. And then, um, I sort of had this dream that caused me to, um, question like whether my faith in God was strong enough. And that just sent me like spiraling hardcore. Mm. Um, and I talked to a friend about it and she was like, Hey, how much time did you put aside for God? Like in the last week? I was like, yeah, literally none. Mm. Well, she asked me like, how much time did you put aside for yourself as well? Cause like I was spiraling. Um, and it was literally none. And so like after that realization, I was like, Oh no, I haven't like, haven't talked to God for like, I saw like weak and no wonder I'm, well, no wonder I'm like losing him a little bit. Mm. And so I was praying, I was like, God, you know, take me back, take me back. I just felt so unworthy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did that for a few days and I was like, I remember lying in my bed and I was actually like crying, like, come on, like take me back. I'm so unworthy. And then, um, I felt reminded like God loves us so much. We don't have to beg. Like mm. it's just. God's going to take us back and we, we are worthy because God covers us. Um, Jesus covers us mm. through his death. Um, so I think that it's just remembering that. And it's so easy to forget though. Like yeah. what I, what I did, like you just forget and like you might, or you might know it like theoretically. Um, but then you're like, nah, yeah, nah, that's not, that's not right. So mm, it's just about remembering that God is covering us. And even though we were unworthy, um, because we we are in the sense that we are we are spiritually naked. Like God covers us and He makes us worthy. So Christopher, do you have any recommended readings? Yes, I am going to recommend uh, you read Ellen White's Patriarchs and Prophets, the chapter. Uh, I think there are two chapters, one about creation and then one about the fall of humanity. Um, And both of those, uh, I think, will have a lot more meaning, considering what we've talked about today, uh, about humility, repentance, nakedness, and all those sorts of topics and themes. So definitely check out those chapters. All right, Kira, where can these people find you? You can find me. Um, I'm writing for the Mighty Warrior Ministries site, so if you want to look at more of what I have, um, including a pretty cool um, testimony, um, you can check that out. Um, as well as you can find me on my YouTube channel. Um, I've grown up a little bit. I have um, added my name to Whoa. my YouTube channel. I know, my what? proper name. Um, prior to that, it was Bugs as an artist. Um, very shameful. Now, it's Kira Lee Josie. Let's not start this. I I don't want. (laughs) I I, I don't want like uh, yeah for that to become too much of a meme. (laughs) So that (laughs) listeners demand that we refer to you as Kyra Lay. Oh, it would hurt. I would actually stop recording. (laughs) Guys, don't hurt Kira. All right. We need, been hurt enough. She's an invaluable yeah. asset. We need her. Please don't. <laughs> please don't scare her. Don't scare her. Okay. okay. Um, yes, you can find me there. Um, also, well, Christopher, where can these people find you? These people can find me here every fortnight on the After Seven podcast. You can also find me on my YouTube channel, Christopher Peterson, spelt with an S E N. And I am also one of the authors of many interesting articles on mm-hmm. the Mighty Warriors. Wait, Mighty Warriors <laughs> Ministry website. Read them. Read, Read them. them. Get into them. They're good. Our latest one was written by Kira, which we oh, actually know by the time this comes out, the last one will be written by me. Ooh. What topic is it is? Wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> Wait and see. Such suspense. Such suspense. But make sure 
to go and check out all the awesome articles and resources we have. Heaps of Bible studies um, and sermons, access to all of our sermons and the podcasts. You'll find everything that you need there on the Mighty Warrior Ministries website, the hub for all of these good things. Remember to like us on our Facebook page and check us out on YouTube. That make sure that way you make sure you get all of the links to upcoming sermons, all the good stuff that we have uh, coming into your feed every week. Thanks so much for supporting us, guys, and for listening in with us. That concludes today's podcast, and we hope that you've been blessed as we've discussed the sermon, Naked and Ashamed. Make sure to come back in a fortnight for another episode, and with that said, have a good one, and good night.